Welcome back to Tying That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good pal, Ty Frank. And this is one of my best friends, which she doesn't know it, but I know it, uh, uh, Anna Banana, Anna Hopkins, who's graciously decided to give her time and help us with Season 5, Episode 2. Yay! Yay! Uh, One of my favorite episodes. This uh, episode's title is Anna in a Box. (laughs) Anna in a uh, box, absolutely. Directed by uh, the world's most adequate director, Breck Eisner. By the way, we, and, uh, we I don't think Anna knows, but uh, we don't compliment Breck Eisner on this show. I okay. was oh. told. I was asked a question earlier and was like informed that I shouldn't compliment. So, which is you know hard. I'm gonna say, but I went. You know, I, I did what I had it's to. O- it's for okay you guys. to say he's adequate. Hold on, Anna. <laughs> That was kind of a compliment that you just Shit. did. Right there. I'm You're sorry. already in violation of the rules. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Joseph, Only when he edits this. Allowed. When Joseph edits this, he can, uh, he can Cut that bleep out. out her compliment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <Love> it. <laughs> bleep it out. <laughs> Anything that's like remotely nice about Brett is just beep, beep out and everything like that. Well, what, what I love about that is it makes it sound like she said something really horrible. Really bad. Yeah. I know. Can you just beep, beep me out at some point on the episode so it sounds like I'm, I'm just a loose cannon? This make you curse like nonstop? Is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> yeah. The, the thing is, though, that Wes and I curse like fucking sailors on this. Right. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. You, you can say whatever you want. Okay. Well, I am a sailor, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think in honor of our lovely guests, we should start with uh, Monica's storyline. And, you know, it has one of those great moments that I love within movies where they call and they say, I have information about something and you need to get here quick. And then when they get there, the place is all tore up and and they've been, you know, abducted. It, like uh, uh, Romance in the Stone is is one that I could think of when, it, when her sister yep. calls or does that. Um, but I am a sucker for those moments. And uh, and that that mystery pulls me in. Can you guys? Can you think, Ty, of any other movies that have that in it that that just pulls you in that you like right away? Or Anna? By the way, uh, Anna, mean, how this kind of works is like we'll kind of we always talk about other movies and everything's like how these ideas or whatever in, spawn interest in these other things. But this reminds me of *Romance in the Stone* when she she talks to her sister and she's like, "I need your help. You got to help me." And then she's missing. Yeah, uh, *Star Wars* has uh, Leia. Oh, calling yeah. and saying, you know, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. Help me, Obi-Wan. You're my only hope. I feel like a lot of 90s thrillers has, have, yeah. have that. Well, just like thrillers in general. Michael Clayton. I feel like I can't yes, pinpoint the moment, but like one. I feel like that's a, yeah. There's I that, recently watched yeah. The Pelican Brief. That is also in the, uh, this movie. <laughs> um, what made you decide to watch The Pelican Brief? Um, I was sick last week and mm-hmm. there was COVID? something, yeah. Yeah. And there was something, uh, I only wanted to watch thrillers. I didn't want to watch any TV. There's there something about like what binge watching television that kind of made me feel exhausted. Whereas like a watching a good sort of satisfying Hollywood movie felt rejuvenating. So every day I would just watch like a 90s thriller that I hadn't seen. And I'd never seen that Pelican Brief. I think that's one of the symptoms of COVID. You can't smell, you can't taste, and you get, you get obsessed with thrillers, like 90s yeah. thrillers. <laughs> <That's> like, <right? laughs> the, the Pelican Brief, weirdly, came up uh, like a week ago. I, I had a conversation with my mother where she was telling me about books that she likes, and she really loves John Grisham. Yeah. And she was talking about the Pelican Brief. And I... Because I'm stupid and I don't have any control over my mouth. I said, that's like the dumbest book. Because, like, multiple Supreme Court justices are murdered. Yeah. And everybody acts like it's just, like, not a big deal. Like, if if two Supreme Court justices were murdered, the National Guard would be locking down the country. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's funny. Like, as I was watching it, because I, it, I, I think I saw it when I was a kid, like, really young. But as I was watching it last week, I was thinking that exact same thing, especially because, you know, I'm I'm so much more involved in understanding, you know, the Supreme Court and like that yeah. these plot points. I'm like, wait, what? 
That's insane. <laughs> but but then, you know, you just let it go and it's like, oh, this is a fun movie. I do. It does have a great line in it, though. When uh, I forget the two characters, but one guy asks another guy if he's got a picture of his girlfriend. And he says, no, she's not a child or a pet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great line. So Ty, walk us through a little bit of this this storyline when Anna calls him and what is she trying to get through to Holden? The idea is Monica has never stopped chasing the protomolecule. Like the the rest of the solar system sort of moved on and decided it wasn't a big deal. And, you know, uh, the arrows thing is over with and this ring thing appeared, but who cares? And the thing that Monica knows is that Holden is the only other person who seems to give a shit about this thing. And she really wants to pull him back into that investigation. And he's just trying to stay out of it. You know, like he, you know, he's, he's done with that. He's risked his life enough times and he's, he's moved on. And she's trying to like entice him back into the mystery of it. And she knows he has this insider perspective on the stuff going on with the protomolecule. And she thinks he stole some protomolecule and hid it and lied to everybody about it. And she's trying to get him to rejoin her investigation and tell the truth about what happened to the protomolecule that she thinks he has. And, of course, she's 100% right about everything. She has totally figured it out. She knows that he has it. She knows he probably gave it to Fred. That's why she's on Tycho. She's like, she's completely figured it out, and she just needs to get him to admit it. And what, it, what is her obsession with the protomolecule? Is it a great story? Or does she understand the threat, the existential threat that comes with it? I would say that it's it's both of those things and more. Um, she also that the the multiple times in which she was completely at risk of losing her life are because of this protomolecule story, and so in a lot of ways it's sort of her war story, right? You know, at the at the end of season three, she was ducked in a corridor where people were actively shooting at her because of this story. So yeah, this is this has become, I think, in some ways, her life work. And Anna, feel free to to chime in and disagree. Whatever I mean, the, you played this character for multiple years, so if you have a different perspective, please. No, that's exactly. I mean, that's exactly what I was doing. Playing it was, um, you know, this idea that everyone is okay with the explanation that they got, and that's a little bit infuriating because, you know, you know that the, it's not it's not the whole story, and I think because it's her life's work that she's been, you know, um, on this beat that there's no way she would just also, you know, join in with everyone and say, yeah, that that's feasible. And also the existential threat of, of, of it, I think is sort of where she shifts into caring about, you know, everyone and not just, you know, her award, which I hope she got. <laughs> so Anna, what what information do you have that you were calling to share with Holden? That's a really good question. I don't know. Ty, do you know? <laughs> what she is calling to to tell him there is that uh she believes that the protomolecule is on Tycho Station and she believes people are on the station looking to steal it. Mm. She has tracked right, the right, story right. to that point. Uh, and and she hopes that by telling him that she can jar him out of his denial and tell us where it is and we then will and tell him it. and tell where it is yeah yeah and then those people kidnapped me and who are those people uh they are people hired by marco to squelch that story because marco needs the protomolecule the fact the protomolecule is on tycho he needs that to remain a secret mm -hmm. that's important to his plan because he's going, he's sending people there to steal it. And if, if everybody knows that that's where it is, they'll protect it. He, he doesn't want that, right? So when Monica tracks that, it's probably definitely on Tycho. Fred probably definitely has it. And she thinks people are coming there to steal it. That's the story she wants. She wants to say, look, it's here. Some people are coming to steal it. We should protect it. That is the opposite story of what Marco wants out in the public. So he, the people that he's got there spying on Fred, he says, hey, while you're there spying on Fred, can you also grab this person for me? Anna, we talked a little bit about in the previous episode about your dancing background, and uh, I probably came in handy with you being locked up in that container and floating around on wires and being weightless and everything like that. 
You want to talk a little bit about your experience and, and your technique and performance and how you kind of communicated the desperateness and being in locked in this thing and losing your oxygen and everything. What was that experience like for you? Um, it was really, it was great. I remember reading it during the read through and I, I had just come back to the show after not being there in season four. And I just kind of remember thinking like, why do they think I can do this? <laughs> or like, how do they, <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, do they, like, shouldn't they That's have how much asked, faith they had yeah, like, you. shouldn't they have asked me before? <laughs> I was so, I was super into it, but I was also a little bit like, holy moly. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I, did I do a movie? I did a movie either before or after where it's called Tin Can, where I am inside a small chamber for the whole movie. And I can't remember if one wait really yeah you did a movie where you're trapped in a in a tin can for the whole movie yeah i mean so they basically you did that movie in preparation for this well that's what i'm trying to remember i can't actually remember if it was before this or after this i think i did tin can before this and i had spent like a month in a set that was way smaller than what we were shooting and because for the container what's really cool about it was that it was sort of three separate sets that were quite open. And it was really just about the, you know, um, the camera positioning and, and a few other things to, to create what we needed to create. But yeah, I just loved, I loved that, that I had, that you guys gave me that job to tell a story without dialogue. It was, it was like, it's like one of the most special acting experiences because you're basically using everything that you learned as an actor that you never get to use like you know really quick changes in oxygen levels and fear and new information and all of these things without dialogue is is like it's a classic acting <laughs> workshop um and so to get to do it with rec which was um, sorry, guys, you can beat me out. I think the word you meant to say was, it was adequate. Okay. Adequate, yes. <laughs> uh, it was, it He's our journeyman director that you got to bring in to do the job. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, one of my favorite parts of the set was the one where I was sitting on a bicycle seat that was spinning around. Um, that was fun. And I mean, yeah, the technique was just, we was just figuring out every single thought that was happening. And, you know, that was, that was the work that I had to do beforehand. And once that was broken down, then the rest came. So yeah, it was, it was still one of my favorite days on set ever. I think we did it in a day. Joseph, you, you it need was to, a long mm -hmm. day. Yeah. Joseph, you need day. to put in uh clips of the, her movie, 10 cam. As she's talking about this. You should. <laughs> so what was the story? What was the story of Tin Can? Like, why were you trapped in Tin Can? So Tin Can was shot before the pandemic, but it uh -huh. is about a pandemic. <laughs> and um, so my character is a parasitologist and she's studying this sort of strange parasite that has taken over. And uh, we meet her. Uh, she's also developing with the company as sort of a way to, you know, preserve yourself. Um, but someone knocks her over the head right at the top of the movie, and we find her waking up uh, in this sort of tin can that she's can. designed herself that's malfunctioning. So the film is uh, – oh, yeah, there, there she is. <laughs> the film – not takes now. place in, inside the tin can and then is there there are sort of flash forward flashback sort of interwoven with her trying to get out and realizing that well i won't spoil it but there are not good things outside of the tin can <laughs> 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 seth a Spoiler. smith directed it very interesting very he's very very art house sci-fi canadian director very cool guy. Him and his wife made this on a shoestring budget in Halifax, and it's really awesome. Hmm. Yeah. Sounds cool. I mean, it 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 sounds very similar because in in this episode of the show, 
it's the same kind of thing. She's trying to figure out how to get out and realizes that getting out is not a good idea. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because when she breaks the seal on the container, that's when things start mm-hmm. to go really bad mm-hmm. for her. Yeah. I'm a big Cronenberg fan, so I'm a big uh, Canadian sci-fi this is fan. Very, so I'll check out that. See, I don't watch a lot of Cronenberg because I also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm don't love body horror and stuff like that. But this film is extremely yeah. Cronenberg influenced. There's a lot of body horror in this. Really interesting sort of ways to shoot inside of a tin can. And his son actually worked on the script uh, with No Seth. way. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Is his son a filmmaker as well? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a huge, I think body horror is probably my least favorite of the, of, of the horror genre, but I do love Cronenberg. I think he's in a class by himself. Mm-hmm. I love this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and his, his, his version of The Fly, even though it was heavily uh, body horror, that's one of my, uh, one of my favorites. I love that movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, The, the um, Fly is a, was a big influence to Seth. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, shit. We got to check it out. We'll talk yeah. about it on the show. Yeah. We'll we'll watch your movie and Good then we'll boy. talk about it. <laughs> Critique it. Criticize yeah, it. <laughs> Make fun of it. Belittle it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the title of this episode is called The Churn. And uh, it's, it's based off a, a novella that, uh, that Ty and Daniel wrote called The Churn. And it's... Mm-hmm. Um, it's it it is it's my favorite of the Expanse book series, and it's kind of the foundation of the character of Amos, and it's something that I read every season before I start shooting a new season because it really helps me start to kind of get grounded in Amos and where he comes from and the, the shapes and events that shaped and molded him to where he is now, and that's why I really loved season five in particular, but I love this episode because. And all the backstory and the imagine, and you do this work in your imagination and everything. And I've talked about this many times, but going into season five and actually going to Baltimore, it was like going in, stepping into my imagination of these things that I was creating. So it was almost like you had this like, you know, movie crew and people that were helping you create this story that you had in your mind for, for six seasons. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit, Ty the actual meaning of the churn. And there is a little, uh, there is a conversation that Amos has with, and I forget his name. What's his name where I'm about to space him. Uh, he's a, Oh, Elias. Elias. Elias no, what's his character's name? I know Elias's name. Oh, um, uh, uh, what did we name that character? Shit. Yeah. Yeah. You, you cornered me and now I can't remember. Anyway. So, uh, but so yes, the character yeah, played by yeah, Elias. So I'm about to space Elias. And I tell him about the churn and, uh, and I remember saying, you know, it's when the jungle tears itself down and builds itself up. And if we die, we don't die. It doesn't matter if we, you know, and it's kind of a nihilist, it's, it's, it's Amos's nihilist, uh, philosophy and he's talking to him, but what is your, what is your, what is your, what is the meaning of the churn and what motivated you to write the novella of the churn? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the most concise description of the churn that we did in the show, and it's the one I, I'm pretty sure I wrote this, is um, float to the bottom or sink to the top. Or no, so yeah, sink to the bottom or float to the top. Everything in the middle is the churn. It's, it is the constant chaos that most people's lives are. It is, it's all the things that happen to you that you, that you have no control over, right? And, Depending on your place in the world and and what's going on around you, there can be more or less of that going on at any given time. But there's always some of it going on. That uh, this chaos that you you have to try to survive. And Amos comes from a place where that chaos was the defining fact of his life. That you could be walking down the street and somebody could just randomly shoot you for no reason. You would have no control over that. You wouldn't know why. What Amos has had to do is come to accept that as a reality and not be angry about it the churn is real that's what happens you can't be mad about it you got to just try to get through it i'm pretty sure i ad-libbed the churn speech just so you know because you were talking about writing it yeah. i don't know if yeah. you want to take well, credit yeah. for my work but um <laughs> well my job is to just transcribe okay what you said. all right maybe it was in rehearsal when i um yeah but the arriving in baltimore which we've talked about 
many times the opening shot, the arrival to, I don't remember who the director was or what his name was, but he did a phenomenal job on the opening shot. And that was actually a helicopter, two crane, lowered down, two handheld, and the handheld picked me up within a crowd of, of close to a thousand people. So we shut down a block in Toronto, had almost a thousand extras, uh, doubling for Baltimore. But what was visually interesting about the shot is it made Earth, and I think it was the first time we've seen another city other than New York uh, within the expanse, but it seemed almost alien because planet Earth is more alien to Amos at this point than any of the planets that we've been to through this thing. So it had like this visual perspective of this alien thing. And Amos shows up in this amazing shot and visually, and I love it when you can, when you can tell so much story visually without saying anything or doing anything. What Anna was just talking about her being locked in the, in the container. Um, and so this shot really is powerful and it does so much to set up the story of being in Baltimore and, and walking the streets alone and seeing visions of somebody who you'll come to learn later is Lydia and, and young Amos, who's Timmy as a little boy. Then you don't want to say anything about the opening shot? That uh, shot was beautiful. Oh, well, I, 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 I didn't realize. <laughs> I do. I didn't realize you were waiting for us. I thought you just kind of went into vapor oh, <laughs> When you say helicopter, like, was it, did it start out as a, on a, like a drone? No, 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 it was, it was an actual, actual helicopter. helicopter. Oh, I didn't an actual know that. Helicopter. It, fl- it flew over yep. the lake, flew up over the lake right. all the way, and then it hands off to a crane, and then the crane lowers, and it's, it's filming the whole time, and the crane How lowers. does it hand well, off when, to a crane? When I say hand off, it's well, a wipe. The, it's a yeah. wipe, so the helicopter. Yeah, oh, it's a wipe. The okay. handoff from the helicopter to the oh, crane. Okay. Is a yeah. Wipe. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking about the shot, like the shot sequence. itself. Okay, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So it's a helicopter. I'm like, whoa, who did that? What camera <laughs> operator did that? <laughs> there was a guy hanging out of the helicopter, <laughs> and he's like, "We're coming in. Are you ready? <laughs> You're ready? You're ready? up. Three people died taking that shot, but we finally got it. We got <laughs> it. We finally it. It was fucking worth it. <laughs> yeah. So worth it. But the, but but the timing of it was really, really remarkable because I'm walking through this crowd and there's like thousands of people. And How so, many times did you guys do it? Uh, I think four. Uh, the helicopter piece, I don't know because um, that was Brett, our, uh, our VFX supervisor, who, who oversaw all that piece of it. But yeah, the, the crane shot to handoff on the ground was, I think you're right, Wes. I think it was four or yeah, five it times. Four, it wasn't uh, that Because it was times. so expensive. You know, it's so expensive to do. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that was, uh, what was that? Like a hundred foot crane? Yeah. Think? Oh, it was, it was, I could not believe that because when, when he started, the crane would find me in the crowd as it's lowering and then it would lower to Jay and Jay would capture it right when the timing was right when I hit this mark and I was a certain distance from the camera and then he would capture it and somebody would unhook it off the crane and then he would just start backing up with me and we'd go to the crowd. Yeah. You know, doing the thing. It was pretty, Pretty remarkable shot. Normally, if if it was a film, you would have a day just for that one shot. Um, but we had, you know, of course, you know, a couple of hours to get that shot in. In terms of that yeah. shot, in like, it was my idea. I designed. Was it, it. Was it you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I storyboard designer camera. <laughs> <laughs> but how does it work if the like? Was it all sort of agreed upon? Like this is our this is our introduction to Baltimore. Like we need to do sort of like major set piece, or is it like you know like who came up with the idea to do something that epic? And was it because of the the story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, that is the director's job to say. I think I think this mm-hmm. is important. I think that we should spend time and money here. Mm-hmm. That's their job. But everybody agreed when Breck had this idea of let's let's really show off this future Baltimore because there's a lot of different story points here. This is the post ecological collapse earth. So like big chunks of Baltimore are mm. underwater and there's there's tops of buildings poking up out of out of the bay. And so, you know, the idea is we're going to show or sweep across the bay, we'll see the tops of buildings that have been drowned, then we'll come up to where the higher point is so it's above the water and then we'll find sort of this crowded very uh, like mm-hmm. high density housing area of the city and then find Amos walking through it. 
And it's great to get to get the drowned earth part of it. But the other part of it is Amos's history in Baltimore is so foundational to his character. And he's talked about it before on the show. And he's and we've we've learned in bits and pieces how much his childhood in Baltimore turned him into what he is. And so not really dramatically connecting the audience to him back mm-hmm. in this place he hasn't been to in decades that that created the man that he is. When Breck said, I want to do this big dramatic thing, the answer, of course, is yes, yes, absolutely, we yeah. should do that. Because we need we need to understand this future world and Amos's place in it. And this one shot really just kind of establishes all of that. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. It really is. It's sort of the a reveal of something that I think a lot of us were imagining as we got to know Amos. They're wondering, you know, what that place was like. So Amos learned that Lydia has passed away. And Lydia, at this point, we don't know much about her, but Lydia is somebody that was Am- the most important influence in Amos' life. He was a mo- She was a mother figure that raised him, that looked out for him, but also became his late lover late in life. And so he goes to the address and he, the reason he's there is that she passed away. He made a deal with his old friend, Eric, that she would be protected as long as he was away. And now she's gone. And so he's going to figure out what happened to her. And if something bad happened to her, he's going to, he's going to execute some motherfuckers. And, uh, <laughs> so he goes to her old house and this stranger answers. But I'll tell a funny story. It happens to be the great Frankie Faison, and Ty and I are massive fans of Coming to America. And so we were so excited to have Frankie Faison on this, and, and, and he was opening the door. And I don't know who put him up to it, but he opens the door, and he has a cigar in his mouth, just like Coming to America. And he answers, like, so we're doing the scene. I'm on the other side of the door. I'm thinking about the scene over the door, and he goes, Opens the door and he has a cigar, like total the character of, of uh, Come to Me. He goes, the fuck do you want? And I was like, oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> you're rinsed through, motherfucker. And then, you know, we, we and it was like so it was like it was a surreal moment of like, you know, as a kid watching, you know, coming to America and over and over and having him do this. So anyway, he was a phenomenal actor. Well, and and yes, in Coming to America. But also I'm a huge fan of The Wire. Yeah. And and he plays, you know, like a, he's in all five seasons of The Wire. And I'm a huge fan of Do the Right Thing. And he's the funniest. He's of the three guys who sit and comment on everything. He's the funniest of those three guys. Hmm. He's the one who uh, the other guy talks about how he's going to buy a boat. And he calls. He says, he says, how are you going to buy a boat? You're ragged as a roach. 30 cents short of a quarter. <laughs> and, you know, he has. I love Frankie. He, he, Frankie has such a, a strength and a masculinity. But also like this really deep vulnerability that he's just a a powerful actor. And uh, but Amos comes to find out he's a little bit suspicious of Charles at first, but he comes to find out he's like, Charles really did love her and she did have a nice life and she passed away. But Charles is going to lose his house. So he has a new mission to go find Eric. He goes and finds, sees his old friend, Eric. And that I thought uh, I can't remember the director's name who did that scene, but I thought it was a great scene (laughs) when he goes, (laughs) he goes and sees Eric. And, uh, and Eric is like, listen, you saved my life and I took care of Lydia. If the old man will stay, he can fucking stay. And I love you, brother. But if you come back, I'm going to have to fucking kill you because I'm the king of the streets now and I can't have somebody else coming to challenge me, you know? And there's a little window and I won't go much into their relationship because we'll do that further on this season, but there's a little window of their relationship and their history together. And then Amos goes to the spot that him and Liddy used to go to all the time where you can overlook Toronto, but it's supposed to be Baltimore. And they're sitting there and, and, uh, and Lydia gives Amos a speech. Do you want to talk a little bit, Ty, about what that speech is when, she's, when, she, when he goes to see that and what she says to him? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if we can back up just a little bit, though, I want to, you know, we talked about the scene with you and Eric. I do want to give a shout out to our, our guy, uh, Jacob. Jacob Mendel, yeah. who plays Eric. Jacob's going to be a guest. I don't wanna, I don't wanna, He's going to be a guest on the show. I know, but I just want to give a shout out to, to Jacob because uh, uh, he was a great find for the show. Very, uh, very lucky find for us. And uh, we, we definitely need to have him come on yeah. and, and we can talk I'm gonna about I'm going to save all, all the stuff. sweet but, things but the, I want to say about him when he's on the show. Go ahead. Okay. 
Uh, but I don't want the audience to think we're ignoring him. No. So we're not ignoring Jacob, him. We're right? going to bring him back later, <laughs> and we're going to talk about all that stuff. Uh, Wes's, Wes's incredible uh, sense of sexual inferiority whenever he's around Jacob <laughs> is driving his, his bad attitude right now. Uh, <laughs> Am no, I that obvious? Uh, no, what Amos is going to talk to uh, Clarissa about later in this season, it is how to be a good person when you're not a good person. That's what she's explaining. You know, that you don't have to instinctively be good. You can study what good looks like and you can emulate that and people won't be able to tell the difference. You know, in, in that way, that's, that's as close to good as people like us can get. But it's worth trying. It's worth at least making the attempt to study what we think good is and try to emulate it as best we can. And encapsulating that idea down into just a few lines is really what her speech is. Is this kind of what you say, what you say to yourself every day, Ty? Because <laughs> inherently you're kind of an evil human being. So you kind of... I, 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 have, I have fully integrated this program into myself. Um, I don't have to repeat this anymore. <laughs> you know, like, I might it's be doing nice things. Yeah, I mean, this, <laughs> yeah it's, it's great. You're doing a great job. Great work. This is this is why I married Janae because Janae is the most instinctively nice person I've ever right. met. So I just I I just asked myself what would she do? She's your Naomi. That's, uh, that's how I get. The, she's my well yeah yeah she's your Naomi or or my Lydia or your Lydia. Um, well, she's yeah. not she's not old enough to be your mother. She is three months older than. Me. <laughs> so. There's moms that are. Three I do months like those older, older women. <laughs> um, so uh, so through that through him remembering that speech, he's moved by it. And he decides to go pay someone a visit. And he calls Ava Sarala to set that up for him. We'll, we'll go into that more in the next episode. I do want to, as long as we have uh, Anna. Anna on the show here, I do want to ask her. It's not, in this, it's not in this part of the season. It's in later in the season. But as an actor, how much fun is it to share screen time with Shari? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's fucking best. I was so happy when I read those scripts when I first got them. It's so fun sharing screen time with her, and it's so fun between screen time with her on set. Yeah, she make, yeah, she makes it a, a great day all the time, and uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I found myself staring quite a bit while I was <laughs> in my. You know scenes. what? You can't help but stare. <laughs> you can't help but stare. Yeah, I know. I, I get know. it. We we all we all stare. Yeah. So for every season anna did they tell you did you know like when you were finished with one season that you were going to be coming back later on or did they just call you before each season so it was always a surprise no, yeah. yeah always a surprise that's you know I'm, i that's how i did arrow for many years like i would get a call and be like okay you gotta go to vancouver next week <laughs> we can't tell you what the script is but just go there and so it was kind of like this too and you were like, as long as it's in my contract, that I don't work with Amos again, then I'm good yeah, to go. Yeah, no. Oh, well, that was a given because of the reports yeah. that were made. Um, yeah, because of the creepy uh, face <laughs> sniffing. But you worked. No, it, you I was worked... really sad. I was sad that that we didn't have like, I know. A, a real Monica Amos scene. In I six. know. I know. I think the the last time we had anything together was with that. Uh, when I, the last time I saw you was uh, in that that big conference hall remember and yeah. uh yeah yeah and that was the thing um that's when uh holden gave everything to drummer fucked everything yeah and we shot that first <laughs> yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah we shot it the we shot that at the beginning of the um season yeah six. that was but my you, first day on but you did arrow and you did another thing in that universe what was it the flash, the flash. right yeah oh you did the flash yeah well my character was introduced in the flash in in one of their crossover episodes, and then yeah. I and then I ended up in Arrow. Did Did you ever work with my buddy Liam? He did. He I, I know he did multiple reoccurring bots on Liam McIntyre. I don't he play. I think he played like the Ice Wizard or something. I don't think so. I think I know the name, okay. but I don't think so. I mean, there's so many characters on those shows. Yeah. Um, but I mostly I I lost I lost track of those shows after like the first. Seasons. There was just yeah, so there's many so of much. Going. Yeah, Flash, Arrow. Yeah, that's that's all we did. So there's two but more there. big uh, 
setups for this episode. Um, uh, Bobby tells Alex about uh, that there's Martian weapons and technology that are being stolen and that she thinks it's an inside job. And she t- mentions Admiral Suther. Is that his name? Suther? Uh, Duarte. No. And because uh, he has that fantastic speech about Martian, you know, uh, military yeah. philosophy and everything like that. And Alex is like, you can't be talking about that guy because, and he goes and tries to have a conversation with him and uh, Sutter's uh, assistant befriends him because she's trying to get information about what, you know, Alex needs to know or what he wants. Um, right. Sutter? Sauveter. 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 Which right. means... Save. I knew it wasn't Sutter because Sutter was the name of a character in season What's two. What's it mean, Anna? So it means save Earth. Was French your first language? No. And then uh, talk a little bit about Drummer and what is the mystery with Ashford's ship? She's just been trying to find it. Uh-huh. Ashford, you know, it, the last time we saw the two of them together, Ashford says, I'm going to go hunt down Marco and kill him. You should come with me. Drummer says, no, I'm tired of following dudes around the solar system and doing what other people tell me. I'm going to go do my own thing. And that's the last time they see each other, right? And so, obviously, Ashford is killed by Marco. And what Drummer has been trying to do is find out what happened. What happened to him? What happened to his ship? Where is it? Because she doesn't um, know it's Marco at this point. She, she assumes, because that's who Ashford was going after. So she assumes that Marco must have got the better of him and killed him. But she wants, she wants the proof. Yeah, so they, she's been looking for that ship. She, and she knows, because these guys are all pirates, she knows that if Marco captured the ship, he would have sold it, right? He would have stripped it and sold it. So she's looking, she's, she's got a search going to see if that ship shows up on the black market somewhere to, for sale, is what she's looking for. So before we leave, we got to give a big shout out to Admiral Delgato, played by my pal, Michael Irby. And uh, him and I did the unit together, and it was really fun to have him on the show. And the other, uh, I remember his first night in Toronto, him and I went to dinner, and we were at dinner, and there was a group of guys sitting next to us to the right. And they looked over, and they saw Irby, and they go, oh my God, the, the, uh, the unit's like one of my favorite, you know, and they got up, and they were shaking, and they looked over, and they go, holy shit, the unit, and they go, oh my God, the expanse. And then, and it was like, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and I was like, we're, we're, we're doing, I wish I remember that guy's name. Great, great group of guys. But I was like, yeah, we're, we're doing, he, he's doing the expanse with us. Um, and they're like, wait a minute. You know, one of my favorite shows was the unit. One of my favorite shows, the expanse and you guys were on that. And now you're on that. So it was like one of those cool, cool moments to, uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I loved, I loved Irby. Yeah, Irby's uh, the I, fucking man. He's the best. He, he was, he was so, nice yeah. when i mean like and really genuine and just excited to be doing the work really loved talking about soccer like like we had like a i think a 30 minute conversation about soccer Wait, are you a soccer a, fan a genuinely uh, i mean i played soccer in high oh, school okay yeah. um but yeah just just a genuinely nice person on set and you know here this we'll bring this back to anna for a second one of the things I learned, and you told me this early on, Wes, and of course I didn't have the experience to understand it, but one of the things I learned is you want to hire talented people, you want to hire people who can do the work, all that. But more than any of that, you kind of want to hire somebody that if you spend 13 hours on a set with them, you don't want to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> and so any, if, if for you uh, want to be actors out there who are listening to this, trying to figure out how to be, you know, have a great career, one of the most important things you could do is be pleasant on set because we remember that and we bring you back. <laughs> We're like, you know who was really nice? That person. Let's ha- work with them some more. But Irby was one of those people, just super pleasant on set uh, and a professional, you know, got the job done, did a really great job and makes me happy every time he's on screen because I got to hide a uh, joke in his name. <laughs> Can we hear because his, his name is Admiral Felix Delgado, Admiral Felix the Cat. Aww. Makes me happy every time. <laughs> Anna, what's your, what is your secret? Because you, you've worked on uh, so many shows, and there's a lot of shows that you've been on like halfway through or done recurring and stuff. Um, if there's days where you're fucking pissed off, 
Like, <laughs> what do you do? How do you do it? Because you're so pleasant every day on set. Dude. I've ne- I've never really been that pissed off. Yeah, you you've been able to like. Kinda, There's nothing on. I mean, uh, set for for actors is like being a baby. Like yeah. you get everything you want. You take yeah, care yeah. of. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's and, and that's a, somebody. If you have to go somewhere, somebody comes and gets you yeah, and like, takes I'm you. I'm like, I'm taking a nap. Can you knock on the door when you want me? <laughs> no, I. I that's, mean, I, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, 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 I what I want to say is I don't want to diminish what you're saying because it, it's true. You know, you really it's important to be professional and to keep your shit in line when you're working. But I, I guess my experience that I've been on some, you know, some great sets that I haven't really been. I don't have a rage problem to start off with, too, which is super helpful. So if you don't have a rage issue, <laughs> then you tend to not get super pissed off on set. But you do need to be, you do need to like, you know, you you have to be strong and like be fair. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. But, th- but do it in a way that, that makes sense because, you know, there's a lot of creative opinions on set. There's a lot of people that want certain things to go a certain way and you have to stand up and be able to defend creatively the way you saw things going. And I always mm-hmm. like my criteria is like if anything isn't about what's on screen i i'm not interested in it you know so it's like if it's any like behind the scenes but if it's on screen then i'm interested i i agree and i think also i i think a big skill that i've learned over the years that i've watched actors that i admire that they have is that it's sort of that the skill of picking your battles understanding the hierarchy of creative what needs to be done in the grand scheme of the scene versus what your character needs to do and at the end of the day managing that navigating that in a smooth kind of professional way is and you're constantly calculating you're constantly like i do have this extra idea but you know what right right now is not the time okay understanding when the time is right all of that sort of managing the the date the, the moment to moment sort of hierarchy of what's important um i think if you can get that right then you people don't hate you yeah. <laughs> but only only an actor like i you know you i i've seen people go to some actor's trailer and they're laying on the couch, they're eat, you know, they got snacks, they're watching a movie, they got the little fire on in the thing, and they got music in the background. It's like, hey, I'm sorry, but we're not going to be able to get to your scene. We're going to have to wait a couple hours. Like, oh, my God. Oh, oh my shit. God. Like, like, oh, what the hell am I going to do for two more hours? I know. You know? And, it's so you know. true, though, but that's the thing. Like, it's so easy to lose perspective as an actor on set because – you know, and, and, and you can start to realize when something pisses you off, when you really think about it and you're like, no, you should not be pissed off about this, you yes. know, and, yeah. and you have to always check yourself because you are treated because, it, you know, now that I'm getting more experience on the other side of the camera, like you, we have to protect the actors. We, they're they're like our little babies that we have to like move into different rooms and make sure that they're safe and like we can't replace them. So you are treated in a way because creatively like you need them. But yeah. if you if you start to buy into it as an actor, then it, uh, everything starts falling apart. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And we do this yeah. thing on the show. We call it a top five at the end of the episode, and uh, we have a topic that is related to the episode and then we do our top five uh the top five best movies that fit that topic and that t- the top five that we choose today will go in the annals of history that is wow. that is like if you're outside of that top five you're wrong okay <laughs> and uh and uh yeah. so so there's a lot of pressure there's, <laughs> there's a, lot a lot of, of pressure writing about this. <laughs> yeah um yeah. so joseph give us a pool i never got the pool joseph did you did you create a pool no, because we just got the topic selected today. <laughs> I thought I thought you right, had well. I thought you knew what you wanted for it. I mean, I can get stuff really quickly. Um, oh, well, you said you said what is the topic? You didn't say, hey, I need to do the pool for it. Hey, yeah, we usually do that a week in advance. Uh, but um, okay, well, Anna, we usually do it. So <laughs> you can come well, back later. Uh, and, I'll uh, be back. Uh, next year yeah. and we can uh, next year <laughs> or or yeah. or uh you can 
tell us what the topic is and we yeah. can figure Maybe, out what our Hey, we can try to are. wing it. All right, let's wing do that. It. That'd be fun. We don't we don't need we don't need Joseph doing our homework. Okay, all right. Let's try let's try to wing it. it. Tell us what the topic is. So I can remember. Uh the topic was uh best movies that feature child trauma. Ooh. So dramatic child. I mean, there's so I, many I love great this topic. Ones. Well, and so, the one that I gave Wes was something that that that's why he liked the topic, but I will not steal his thunder and I will mute myself right now. <laughs> Wait, so the well, that's Features kind of child my trauma. <laughs> okay, so I mean, right away, obviously, the the way that the children are are approached by the reporter in Die Hard, very <laughs> traumatic. Yeah. So Die Hard's got to go on the list, you know, got to go in the zero position. By the way, Anna, we find a way to put Die Hard on every yeah, list. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, like trying to make wanted. this. Okay, yeah. yeah. She, I saw her do like the polite laugh. She yeah, goes, I'm like thinking, I'm like, what scene? Fucking uh, Die Hard? Like, <laughs> as a clown, he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, the movie has to be about the major emotional thrust is childhood trauma. I, I would so say the, E.T. is it would be a really good one. Oh, that's a great one. Okay, so E.T.'s on the list. Um, I, I would say like every every Stephen King movie, yeah. it can wind up well, on this list. Like specifically, because it that's it's yeah, pretty bad. Really focused. Yeah, well, I, I and Doctor Sleep it definitely, but Doctor Sleep, Cujo, Cujo. You know the kid trapped in the car with the dog trying to break in. I mean, there's Stephen King explores childhood trauma mm-hmm. a lot right. in his fiction. But yeah. it and Doctor Sleep is a, is a really the 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 engine is the childhood trauma of the movie. Yes. Yep. Um, what about Labyrinth? Good one. Mm. I mean, she's 16, but it's also like a, her, the, it's her baby. <laughs> Look, you you do not have to justify any Jennifer Connelly <laughs> Thank movie. Thank you. Today. Dance, all Jennifer dance. Connelly movies <laughs> automatically. I mean, it's just very uh, traumatic. Okay. Like, Power like, and the babe. <laughs> who do what you babe? do? <laughs> <laughs> what babe? Who babe? <laughs> Power of the babe. <laughs> and let. La- <laughs> Labyrinth also features, I think, the world's greatest and most epic cod piece. I agree. Yes. So, yeah. uh, David Bowie yeah. in Labyrinth was my first crush as a child. Really? Yes. <laughs> that says so much about you. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That was your first crush. Yeah. You, you thought it was hot. You thought that He's so hot in that movie. But the music is great. The music movie. is so. The everything is, about that movie is great. The music's amazing. His, D- David Bowie, look, I, I'm a dude. I've been married 30 some years. I have nothing to try to Would excuse you fuck here. David Bowie? David Bowie's yeah, fucking hot. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> David, Particularly in like, that movie. Like anyone who says they wouldn't fuck David Bowie is a liar. <laughs> I really yeah. agree with All right, you. So, so Labyrinth, and you gave a strong case of why that could make the top five. Um, <laughs> the, the movie that Joseph's referring to is called The Antoine Fisher Story. Oh, yeah. Because oh, that yeah. movie yeah. was shot on my ship when I was in the military and that's uh, what really got me started. I mean, I started young, really young or whatever, but that was like the Antoine Fisher story was like the first time they had me come read for it and audition for it, mm. and meet up Denzel and everything. And they wanted authentic military guys to be a part of the film. And so that was my first experience with, uh, and I, I've told this story before, right? Ty on the podcast. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, you've talked about your conversation with Denzel, which, by the way, is awesome. Whoa. Right. I mean, only one of the greatest actors probably in the history of acting. Just just hanging yeah, out with him. I'm so jealous the, because, I, because I also feel like I've been yes. hanging out with him because of the Pelican Brief and also watching Inside Man. What is that? So when I was, when we were on the ship, we had these things, these are called memo books, right? So you write down like equipment or things that you need or whatever. And so when Denzel was there and we were doing this movie and I was like, this is, you know, this, this, this is fantastic. You know, this is, you know, always been, you know, a dream of mine and passion of mine. And he found, and he's like, look, you know, uh, I heard that the casting director, you, you know, wants you to come out and read for a few other things and everything. And then as we were talking, he took my memo book and he wrote to Wes, God bless, see you in the movies. And I was, you know, 18 years oh old my God. when he wrote that. And so he put that in this thing and I showed it to his, I did a, I did a small thing on Tenet and his son was, right. you know, son in the, yeah. yeah. And so, and I was like, Hey, I got to tell you the story about your dad, man. And he was like, get the fuck out of here. And he took a picture of it and showed it to his Aww. dad and everything. So, so Antoine Fisher's story has a special place in my heart. I don't know if it's going to make the top five though. Mm. 
Well, the background cast was not great. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, what about Good Will Hunting? That's about yeah. uh, childhood trauma. And that's, that's a very good example. Yeah, that's a great, great example. Fuck you, Sean. Fuck you. Not you, man. Not you. It's not your fault. It's not, it's not your fault. <laughs> Back up. Back the fuck up. <laughs> You got a hug. <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> uh, Leon, the professional. Oh, that's good. Oh, yeah. 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 With Natalie that's a great Portman. Movie. With uh, Natalie Portman, yeah. Phenomenal movie. I, I mean, I, so I, I really like Luc Besson, and uh, I, I almost always enjoy his movies, and I really enjoyed The Professional, but every time I watch it, it seems slightly mm. creepier to me. So I can't I can't watch it anymore because I just it, it tipped a cor it turned a corner where now when I watch it it's just yeah I think the as way. as the um, years the go on yeah. yeah yeah oh I yeah. I haven't seen it in a long time but it was one of my favorite movies I was, as a kid because I was around her age so I got right. the yeah. love story yep. but yep. I think probably. The two fictional characters that I've loved the most in my life have always been Natalie Portman because it was the professional. <laughs> you know, Natalie Portman's a real person. I know, but it, it was fictional. her characters. Like it was Natalie, it was ah. the professional, but it was uh, Alice and Closer. I, I don't yeah. know what it is about that character. Did you ever see Closer, Anna? Yeah, I've seen yeah. Closer. I don't know. Wait, what, what were you saying about her character? I was saying the two fictional characters that I've been in love yeah. with in my life is. Natalie Portman in The Professional and Natalie Portman in Alice. Alice in Closer. I don't know. There's something about that character that was. Anyway, so we can, we can just, instead of like just thinking what else, what else, we can just use this pool unless you guys have other things you want to do now. We usually have, by the way, our Patreon members, they have like um, pages of things and then we go through and pick our favorite. There, there is one that we're missing, though, that definitely needs to be on this list, and that is... Uh, Carrie Henn as um, as Newt in Aliens. Oh um, yes, her her trauma yeah. drives mm -hmm. is one of the drivers of that story. Yeah, that's a good I point. Feel like my... is, is it childhood though? Would butterfly effect qualify? No, I've never it's seen a terrible it. movie. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and you should be embarrassed right now. <laughs> How dare you? I've never Just... seen it. I was thinking of childhood trauma, like as ch like child characters. But now I realize childhood. How about Halloween? Yeah, Halloween. Um, Halloween qual qualifies. The only other one I, I had listed was potentially Sling Blade. You know what? Mm -hmm. I I've I really like Sling Blade, and I think I oh yeah. you've never yeah, seen you Sling Blade. Love Sling Blade. It's phenomenal. Yeah, definitely. It's it's there's a reason why Billy Bob Thornton became a bit, a huge star after that, because um, it really does showcase him in a yeah it, it makes it very clear that he was a he was a mm. phenomenal talent but yeah it is and it is about abuse and and uh trauma and uh what yeah. about conan well yeah i mean obviously conan belongs on the list because he was sent north to the vanier mm. where he had to push the wheel of woe until he got jacked the and then he had to fight all this people <laughs> in the pit and then and beastmaster because <laughs> his whole family got slaughtered at him his whole family got murdered. Yeah, yeah. you know, guys, to, I'm gonna have so much fun yeah. with the B-roll on this episode. And the, his whole family got slaughtered, and it was so traumatizing it turned him into Mark Singer. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think uh, let's go ahead and do our top five. And if you guys think of other ones, we'll come up two, three. I think Goodwill Hunting is like an exemplary yeah, example of this. Yeah, so we we'll put that one on there. I, I would vote for it. Mm -hmm. Me too. Because I mean that's. It it is I mean it as as a movie in its own, but also as a stand in for Stephen King's body of work in uh, stories about childhood trauma. Like yeah, I mean it is probably the right. best one. So yeah. And Anna, you did a great call, call with E. T. because you know I saw that movie recently and I didn't realize how much divorce was such a main thing that was running through the movie and what they were dealing with. It was fucking powerful. And, you know, when the mother, like, at, you know, is breaking at the end and she's, you know, he hates Mexico. <laughs> you know, it's like, so. Yeah, it is. It is really <laughs> beautiful. By the way, she was the mother in Cujo, too. <clears throat> yep. 
Yeah, for a stretch there, she played all the moms. <laughs> she was like every mom. And Sling Blade doesn't qualify because Anna hasn't seen it. But it I think that would be going on the list. I think we can put on the list. All right, so we have Good Will Hunting, It, E.T., Dr. Sleep. I mean. Wes and I are both huge fans of Dr. Sleep, but uh, we're, I think there's only two of us. We're the only two who are I mean, I'm happy to vote for you it. You know what? In honor of David Bowie's codpiece, we'll put Labyrinth <laughs> on there. Yay. <laughs> As in these in these special codpiece <laughs> categories, that was Anna's first crush. Yay. All right, so we have Goodwill Hunting, It, E.T. and Labyrinth. What's number five? I I'm gonna argue for Aliens because it's yeah. one of my favorite movies of all time. I think uh, it, she never acted again. Carrie Han only did that one part, but I thought she did a nice job in it. I think the character of Newt is very uh, is a very good character, very interesting character. Yeah, and it is. Sigourney Weaver's attempt to save Newt from that trauma that drives the whole back half of the story. Yeah, and it also gives an emotional center to it that the the first aliens didn't have. So it's great. So Good Will Hunting, It, E.T., Labyrinth, and Aliens. I love it. Thank you, Anna. That's a fun group. Yeah. And Die Hard in the Zero Spot. <laughs> and Die Hard in the Zero Spot. And Die Hard in the Zero Spot. Because those poor traumatized kids because the reporter <laughs> confronted you know, their, their housekeeper. I'm still like, um, this was fun. And I thank you so much for doing, uh, two episodes with us. I know it was long or whatever. And I hope one day we'll be, I'll be back up in Toronto and be able to hang out with you. And if you ever come to Atlanta or LA, make sure you call. I will. Come. Thank you guys so much. It was so nice to hang out. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for hanging out. This was fun. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty. Yeah.